Well, I think it's um, <clears throat> really, um, I'm very excited to be a part of this um, celebration of truth of Austrian School of Economics. Uh, just two days before the um, birthday of Ludwig von Mises and the 15th anniversary of the Institute, uh, it really shows who won. And uh, for me, interestingly enough, after my uh, studies in the University of Marxism Leninism, uh, to get this uh, wonderful license plate called LV Mises, and you can see Dr. Gordon is approvingly inspecting this, um, this license plate. Well, Austrian school is um, <clears throat> definitely the most anti-socialist school of uh, economic thought. It completely demolished the intellectual foundations of socialism, um, starting with Karl Menger, um, actually, with publication of his book in 1870. He made, and I believe that that's really so, he made Karl Marx completely speechless. Marx never wrote anything in economic theory after 1870. Um, then Bombavirk, uh, he uh, completely smashed the objectivist theory of value at the end of the 19th century. And von Mises uh, and Hayek and Murray Rothbard continued this work of dismantling uh, the pretense of socialism as being a scientific teaching. Well, all the <coughs> all predictions of Austrian School of Economics came absolutely true. And the whole history of the 20th century was the history of human suffering um, when the people are, were trying, as Ludwig von Mises um, said, uh, to revolt against economics, to revolt against economic theory. 20th century is what two and a half years left only. And 12th, uh, 20th century probably will be considered by the humankind, by the future historians, as one of the most bloodthirsty, one of the most criminal um, centuries in the, in the history of, of, of humankind. Uh, over 170 million people were slaughtered during this century by their own governments, not in the war, but in a peacetime situation. The governments were trying to impose all kinds of social utopias, uh, all kinds of socialist social utopias, uh, no matter of what color, whether it was uh, Soviet communism or German Nazism. Uh, the whole idea is uh, the same. The idea, the same socialist uh, <coughs> socialist idea. I was uh, listening to uh, Dr. Gordon's um, description of uh, Edward Bernstein, of that uh, German social democrat, and I recollected kind of personal uh, encounter with Bernstein. I came from um, Kazan, I was born in, at the Republic of Tatarstan, uh, one of parts of Russian Empire, and in 1938, uh, Josef Stalin declared a campaign of purges against something he called Bernsteinian sleaze. And uh, Bernstein, by Bernsteinian sleaze, he meant some kind of, he described as half, half-baked, half-baked socialism based on uh, immoral principles. And uh, in Kazan, which is a predominantly Muslim part of um, uh, uh, the former Soviet Union, 700 peasants, 700 peasants were physically slaughtered because they were considered to be this Bernsteinian sleaze. I think this logic was very well described today in the morning by Dr. Levin, um, who um, uh, the socialist logic was that, that Muslims are, are, are the same as Jewish and peasants are the same as Bernsteinian intellectuals. But when I was thinking about that, I realized that most governments today, I think, uh, both here and in Western Europe, can be, from Stalinist perspective, called Bernsteinian sleaze, in the sense that it's again the same combination of half-baked socialism and, I would say, uh, being very far from morality. And today's socialism, I think, in the United States, except academia, when it is alive and thriving and open and proud, uh, but outside of academia, I think socialism takes forms of different social movements of different social movements. And these social movements, uh, uh, what's common uh, 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 of all of them with socialism, as Mary Rothbard put it, that private property is eliminated, individualism goes by the board, individuality is flattened, all property is owned and controlled communally, and the individual units of the new collective organism are in some vague way equal to one another. And um, <coughs> It kind of also occurred to me that this, um, this new social movements are the most, 
the most, I would say, lively today form of socialism we experience today. What's common between them is, again, the hatred of private property. Well, with the, <coughs> the rise of uh, communism, say, in, the, in, 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 in Russia, was due mostly to the attacks on private property which were conducted even before the bloody revolution of 1917. In Russia, the cost of socialist experience were over 60 million people. Over 60 million people were slaughtered in the dreadful gulag. Um, the attacks were again uh, on everything the people would cherish. On private property, which was considered to be a crime. Uh, it was attacks on family. In 1920s, uh, the Soviet government openly unleashed a campaign against, against family by uh, suggesting the uh, so-called communal families, meaning that uh, all children should be socialized, that people should not see each other on a permanent basis, and all children should believe that all adults are their parents, and uh, all parents, all adults should, should consider all children to be of their own. <clears throat> and I remember I was in San Francisco about a year ago, and uh, attended a, a meeting with Hillary Clinton. She was promoting her book, uh, It Takes a Village, yes. And one person in the audience asked her whether, uh, and she said, well, the government, the community, the business leaders, they're all responsible for children. And one person in the audience said, what about family? What about the parents? She said, oh, parents as well, parents as well. She kind of permitted parents also to be included in this process. In the Soviet Union, I think the, the, this uh, campaign against families resulted in sanctification, glorification of, a, of 11 years old Pavlik Morozov, who reported to KGB about his father, who was storing grain, who was hoarding grain. Uh, and um, uh, his father was immediately murdered by the KGB squad in the backyard of his own house. And this young uh, boy, he was axed by his grandfather who was also then shot by the KGB squad. So it's a very tragic, I would say, very dramatic story of completely confused morals, completely confused, uh, confused young, young boy. Uh, but then they named all practically, every second high school was named after Pavlik Morozov, as well as a lot of streets, as a lot of, a lot of uh, community centers were named after him, and he was considered to be the most, uh, the most good example for, for all young, young people. Um, it also brings me to thoughts, um, I think, best described by Murray Rothbard, that communism was not, a, was not a system of scientific thinking at all. It was a religion. It was a religion. And uh, in his, in his uh, brilliant essay, Karl Marx says, religious eschatologist, uh, Murray Rothbard is um, <coughs> uh, writing that uh, the, bottom, um, the bottom line about Marx is that he was a communist. And in the same way as the return of the Messiah in Christian theology will put an end to history and establish new heaven and new earth, so the establishment of communism, according to Marx, uh, to Marx would put an end to human history. And this end, they really tried to put in a very hard way. Um, there were uh, uh, streams of blood going from Russia to Kampuchea, from China to Yugoslavia, um, the uh, number of people slaughtered, the number of intellectuals gone uh, was overwhelming. The whole idea of communism was to impose the new man, the new man, the, the, the formation of the new person who would obey his intellectual leaders, who would be completely in complete compliance, kind of an ideal, an ideal person who would not ask anything for the labors of his work. Uh, he would not, he would be in full compliance with what uh, these intellectuals as um, <coughs> striving for power would uh, do of him. Um, Grigory Malenkov, uh, who was close associate to Stalin and later became a general secretary of the Communist Party, um, he called it that it's permitted costs of introducing this eternal happiness on people. So those people who would not comply with this idea of eternal happiness should go. So the socialism um, in, say, in Soviet Union, in China, in all other communist countries, and there were 33 of them, can you imagine, there were 33 countries in the world with a population of 1.4 billion people were professing communism, um, uh, professing communism until 
uh, uh, practically five years ago. And, uh, and most of these countries, those at least which were not uh, suffering from this Bernsteinian sleaze, which was kind of a milder version of, of communism, most of them were in the process of this holy war against any kind of free thinking. And this holy war resulted uh, both in skimming the milk and throwing the, the cream away all the time, skimming intellectuals, uh, uh, skimming the best people, and because of that, today in Russian um, philosophy, a lot of Russian philosophers and sociologists are talking even about the complete thinning of the genetic fund of, the, of, of, of Russian people. Because for the last 70 years, the best, uh, the entrepreneurial, the free, uh, they were all uh, being consistently removed, murdered, could not reproduce themselves at all. And only people who would be conformed, people who would try to actually to drown their desires, their uh, qualities in, in heavy drinking and alcoholism, it's not a coincidence that, um, that uh, Russia, uh, consumption of alcohol in Russia is four times even today, four times higher than in the United States. Four times higher than the United States. So, and the United States is also uh, becoming more and more drinking drinking um, uh, country. I think maybe, maybe someone would even do a, a correlation analysis will, will put econometricians to good use. Maybe they can, they can see how uh, the amount of socialism correlates with, with, with drinking. The <clears throat> Ludwig von Mises, in 1918, his um, essay, Economic Calculation of the so uh, Socialist Commonwealth, it uh, proved a uh, complete impracticability of socialism. So socialism, today um, I'm teaching at, say, University of San Diego, and unfortunately it's not state university, it's a Catholic school, but um, at the University of San Diego, and I'm all the time discussing the issues of so-called comparative economic systems, comparative economic, it's taught uh, in most American universities. But there are no comparative economic systems. Von Mises proved uh, that that socialism is not an economic system. It's not an economic, it's a non-economic system. It's a revolt against economics. It's a simple system of management based on coercion, based on violence. It's, uh, it's run more or less the command system is more or less run the same way, uh, the same way, uh, as, uh, say, um, um, army or wherever, the people are ordered to work. That's why. And that's why it collapsed so suddenly and unpredictably for our CIA and other intelligence uh, establishment in Washington, D.C., who never read von Mises, uh, they could predict it uh, very accurately. But the prediction would be based on a simple assumption that when they would start shooting people, then they are gone. And that's exactly what happened. When they, kind of as Soviets would say, run out of bullets, then it collapsed. It imploded as a cart house. And that's, I think, that's what Mr. Gorbachev should be credited for, that in his ignorance, he removed violence out of the system based on violence. And the glue, the only glue which kept that nation together, the only glue which, which actually would be forcing people to go to work and do something there, it was gone. And since 1989, uh, all the socialism is gone and, it kind of, and these countries are in free fall. Another prediction of von Mises. And especially, I would say, of Murray Rothbard, uh, was that how they should desocialize. How it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to go that way, but they did it. They did all the way. They murdered all these people. Um, but right now, the issue is how to return back from this insanity and how to return back with keeping all the skeletons in the cupboard. Because can you imagine if 60 million people out of 200 million population of Soviet Union were physically slaughtered, how many executioners should be around? Can you imagine how many people were involved in these murders? How many people believed in this? And today, uh, this, this, I would say, the burden of the past is so overwhelming that I think that for some countries it's just very difficult even to overcome the shock, overcome the shock to find out that all the modern history was the history of lies and crimes and nothing else. And for people, especially of older age, it's very, very uh, uh, bitter, uh, uh, bitter pill to swallow. And that's why we see all the time this, that this communists are bouncing back because communists are providing people with some comfort. No, it's not, it was not all, all crimes and lies. 
that we see this, this, uh, the same mentality. For example, President Yeltsin yesterday uh, endorsed this decree uh, prohibiting um, other denominations rather than for, um, for uh, so-called mainstream denomination, Russian Orthodox, Jewish, uh, Muslim, uh, and Buddhist, uh, which I consider to be right now uh, uh, government religions in, the, in, in Russia today, uh, which is uh, um, uh, kind of the pendulum swung in another direction. But um, prohibiting all other denominations to do it, again, that's the same, the same thing that they, were, they still, still cannot admit that freedom is better than slavery. Moreover, right now, it's again the new speak um, quite a lot, and, and private property also formally endorsed in, say, Russia, in Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely fake. If you read New York Times or Los Angeles Times, uh, you would see that, that right now the major problem of Russia, from the perspective of New York Times and Washington Post, is the problem that greedy capitalism is completely dislodged all the social structure in Russia, that people are starving because of this greed, um, of, of this capitalist, of this un, um, absence of compassion and things like that. But what kind of capitalism we can talk about that even today, and nobody would mention that, even today in Russia, all land belongs to the state. I mean, the land is nationalized. I mean, this is, this is one thing. I mean, how you can, what kind of property uh, relations you can talk about if Anything you do is on a state-owned land, and the state can ask you to move any time. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing that they adopted 270,000 different regulations following our example, that unmitigated capitalism is... And so with 270,000 regulations contradicting each other, uh, property rights, again, is, is a fake. It's, it's just a joke. Um, the same we see here in less um, kind of obvious form, but when Mises in 1929, he wrote the critique of interventionism, showing that interventionist governments, it's just an extension of socialism. It's just a little bit less of it. But it's not the matter of qualitative difference. It's a matter of quantitative difference. It's a matter of how much of regulations you have. And the more we are regulating economy, the more is so-called artificial need to regulate more and more. Because the more problems you introduce with government regulations of the economy, the more government you need to attend these problems. And so this is really like a drunk who never can get real drunk. So it's, and that will, that the logic of it, as Van Mises showed, it will bring us exactly to the same kind of things that the people in Eastern Europe and Asia experienced for the last, uh, from 50 to 70 years. The logic of collective action, um, is to have as much government as you can. And uh, because of that, I think that this awful experiment, which that people staged on themselves, uh, that we should learn something from that. We should learn something from that. From that, the fate of this 170 million people, uh, 170 million people who are physically slaughtered to make this experiment happen. Um, I'm on a sabbatical leave from my college, and they found a replacement for me. Um, and the chair of my department called me and he said, um, the person who is replacing you put a, a big picture of Stalin in your office. A big picture of Stalin in your office. So wherever you defect, uh, you would have a picture of Stalin hanging in your office no matter what. And uh, that's why I think that the Institute is doing a great, great work in, in providing an intellectual alternative, intellectual counter-revolution to the ideas of statism, the ideas of coercion, the ideas of, of state-endorsed violence against people. And I'm so proud to, um, to be kind of, I would say, an ambassador of institute uh, at my college, 11 students of which attended already Ludwig von Mises University. Right now I'm trying to work on the University of San Diego students, and hopefully we'll see many of them attending this, uh, this I would say, festival of intellectual freedom and free thinking um, in, um, moreover, when I came to the United States, I really thought that it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. And then, <laughs> and then I see that there are not so many brave left, yes, <laughs> and not so many free left, yes. And, and I never would think about myself that I would be an object of such a ferocious attacks. Right now I'm being named neo-Nazi, neo-confederate, whatever it means. Never everybody, and which, uh, which 
does not discourage me. Moreover, it brings me more, I would say, incentives, more it boosts my morale to fight for freedom as much as I can. And um, I would like again to return back to the Austrian school that starting with Karl Menger, uh, Bum Baverk, von Mises, Hayek, and Rothbard, we have an intellectual tradition of, of immense strength. And the strength of this tradition is that we tell the truth. I was very close to Austrian economists. He kind of deviated all his life. He would go into, it would become kind of conservative Keynesian and then bounce back. His name is Gottfried Habler. Gottfried died uh, three years ago uh, in Washington, D.C. But I was quite close to him when I was in Washington. And he was, at that time, 95 years old. And I kind of asked him, what's the, what's the reason that the Austrian economists, the longevity is so is uh, life expects so high. He said, he looked at me, he was very frail at that time, he looked at me and he said, because we never lie. That's what he said, we never lie. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that's, that's the strength of the school, that it's, 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 I think it's kind of almighty because it's true. And it's just a matter of time that people are trying everything else, and they've tried practically everything else, and it didn't work. And... And because of that, I think the future is for Austrian school. And I would think that, that what, what we observe today is just such a manifestation of success and, and strength of us. Um, and for me especially, being, uh, being kind of an only neo-Nazi, neo-confederate on campus, uh, to be part of this, to be part of this, uh, uh, great intellectual celebrations, it's just so, it's, it's so, it's so needed to know that you are not alone, that you are not, thinking that you're not so different from, from all these people and happily you are different from that people and that, that really provides me with, with a lot of strength. Well, and also I would say that Austrian economics, besides, besides showing intellectual uh, uh, futility of socialism, it also provides us with a lot of, I would say, real-day real day, uh, prescriptions, real-day um, recommendations what to do with the economy if the economy is in a bad shape. And again, Mary Rothbard, he developed a very logical, very logical uh, system of desocialization, how these countries should desocialize. And the whole idea of the system is that private property based on very fast, on a fell swoop kind of reform approach, that's what, what would pay. And those countries which followed his advice uh, and some countries did, like Czech Republic or Estonia, um, they are doing much better. And yesterday I was reading the World Bank report, uh, and even the central planners from the World Bank, uh, they were forced to admit that only those countries which went far enough and fast enough did make it. And those countries which didn't, for example, like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, which still have the government property on land, which, they, which do not respect private property at all, uh, these countries are doing much worse than uh, they would uh, be doing otherwise. Uh, then also, another thing is that today we see the revival of Austrian tradition, say in Russia. Right now in Russia there are three free market institutions openly proclaiming their allegiance to Austrian School of Economics. Uh, the uh, socialism, liberalism, uh, bureaucracy, planned chaos, these books were all translated into Russian language. For socialism, they have a second printing. First printing was 15,000. Right now it's 25,000. The second printing of, 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 um, of socialism by von Mises. Uh, the book which Hayek uh, testified that opened his um, mind open to Austrian economics, that he, he was a socialist himself uh, uh, before reading, reading uh, von Mises' uh, socialism. Um, there are just, what, Two months ago, they started something called Catalactics Institute in Lithuania. Uh, there are free market institutions in all Baltic states, in Czech Republic. In Czech Republic, five or six of them already. So we can see that, that this intellectual tradition is, is reviving there. Austrian School of Economics was all the time the most hated school back in the Soviet Union, and rightly from the communist perspective. So... Um, uh, um, Nikolai Bukharin, who was the secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, was a student of Bombavik in 1912 in Vienna. And upon his return back, he said, this is the enemy, this is this, the enemy, the enemy. All other intellectual traditions, he said, they're not strong enough. 
they are not sincere enough and they are not close enough to, to Austrian school. And so Austrian school of economics was considered to be, von Mises was considered to be like the most reactionary, which uh, for hearing from whom we heard it, uh, I think was the best compliment the Soviet communists could make to von Mises. And so um, on this note, I think I will, uh, would like to congratulate all of you because I think it's the, uh, the event which we're all uh, very happy to be part of. Thanks.